Are you much afraid, my friend? Do you tremble? Do you fear for your life? Do you fear for your job? Do you fear that you're not going to be everything that you should be? Oh, beloved, listen to me. God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's given you power and love and a sound mind. And if you want to make it in spiritual warfare, you've got to know that you cannot stand in fear. Instead, you stand in the peace of God. We'll talk about it today. has always been a tactic in warfare. I mean, the enemy wants to terrorize you. And God tells us in 1 Peter that our adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, if you're in the jungle or if you're wherever a lion is and the lion is silent, You don't know that he's there. But if all of a sudden you're walking along and you hear this awful roar, then you are filled with fear. The devil was there all along. The lion was there all along. But maybe you didn't know it until he roared. And then when the roar happened, it accomplished the purpose. It just absolutely froze you in terror. We're going to talk about fear. We're going to talk about the answer to fear. We're going to talk about warfare as we continue looking at the armor of God. God has let us know through Paul as he writes and brings to a close his letter to the Ephesians that we are in a warfare and that you and I need to know how to stand in these evil days, how to resist the enemy. And he tells us that we are to stand having girded our loins with truth. We've already looked at that and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what I want us to look at is I want us to go to the second piece of the armor that he points out that you and I are to already have put on, and that is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate was what protected the vital organs. Remember, they were in warfare with spears. They were in warfare with swords. And so they were going to come at the man's head or they were going to come at the man's chest. Why? Because that's where the heart is. That's where the liver is. That's where the lungs are. That's where the pancreas is. And if they can get to that man and and get him in his vulnerable uh, 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 position of his anatomy, then he can bring them down. Then they can defeat him. So it's absolutely vital that in warfare, you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what you have to understand, and and first of all, I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 6 because I want you to have your Bible open. After all, what is Precepts for Life all about? Precepts for Life is about you and me discovering, you and I discovering truth for ourselves by learning to study the Bible inductively. Inductively means we go to the text itself. We observe it to discover what does it say. We understand then how to interpret it. What does it mean? And then how to apply it. Well, he tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, 14, stand firm, therefore, since you're in a warfare, since you've got an enemy, stand firm, therefore, having, and remember, we looked at the word having, he uses it three times here, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, let's go, first of all, to the breastplate of righteousness. 
You and I need to understand that when we came to know Jesus Christ, that day, that moment, when you believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, you received the righteousness of God. You were a sinner. You owed God righteousness. And what God did was he took your sin, and because Jesus paid for it in full, God credited your account with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'll never forget when I went down on my knees on July 16th, 1963. I mean, I knew that I was a sinner because just before I came to know the Lord, I, I, I started thinking, what if I was to stand before a holy God? I didn't believe in a literal heaven or a literal hell because I hadn't been taught about one. Although I had been raised in the church, I wasn't raised in a church that put an emphasis on the word of God. It was on ritual rather than the word. And so I had a religion, but I didn't have a relationship. Uh, the word of God was read, but it wasn't expounded. It wasn't explained. I wasn't taught how to study it. It was just part. You would read the epistles over here. You'd read the Old Testament there, and you went through the Ritual, and I was a young girl looking around to see how many new boys there were in church or if I catch, could catch the eye of someone that I admired and I was in hot pursuit of. So anyway, I was sitting there and I was thinking, God, someday I'm going to stand before you. And that's all I understood was I'm going to stand before God. That was the Spirit of God convicting me and, and, and bringing me to my own sense of sin. And I thought, if I stand before God, if I stand before God, He's going to look at me and He's going to say, depart from me. And that's all I knew was that, that I was not clean enough. I was not righteous enough. So this is what I did. I decided that I would make get my act together and that I would quit being immoral, that I would quit living the way that I lived and, and that I would be everything that I should be. But as it says in Romans 7, the good that I wanted to do, I couldn't do. And the evil that I didn't want to do, I did. And then Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, this body that continues to sin? And then it says at the end of Romans chapter 7, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that day when I went to my bedroom and when I fell on my knees beside the bed and I cried out to God, I didn't know the transaction that took place. I didn't know that when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, as 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, that God made him to be sin for us, that we might have his righteousness. And I didn't know that at that moment, when I was down there on my knees, that God was crediting to my account in heaven the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but he was also imparting to me righteousness. Now, how does he impart righteousness to us? What is it that makes the difference? Well, when you move into Romans 8, you see it's the Spirit of God that is given to you. In Ephesians chapter 1, remember, it says, having heard the message of your salvation, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of the redemption of this purchased possession, at that moment on my knees, God gave me the righteousness of Christ. He gave me the Holy Spirit, who not only am I declared righteous, but I am enabled to live righteously. Let's look at it for just one quick minute, and it's going to be a quick minute, because I want us to get on to the gospel of peace, and I want us to get on to the subject of fear. But I would like you to go to Romans chapter 8, an incredible, incredible chapter. It says in verse 3, for what the law could not do, the law could tell you to be righteous, but the law could not make you righteous. I knew the law. I knew the Ten Commandments, but I didn't know how to keep them. 
I was unable to be obedient all the time. So it says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, because my flesh was sinful. It says, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a human being. He became flesh and blood. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, sin was taken care of. It was condemned. It was dealt with. And then he goes on to say, so that, and this is what's so beautiful, beloved, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And the requirement of the law is righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is doing what God says is right. So that the fulfillment of the law, living righteously, it says so that the fulfillment of the law, the requirement of the, of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And then he goes on to say this. He says, the things, those who are in the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit on the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, life and peace peace. So when he's talking about you and I having on the breastplate of righteousness, first of all, you and I have to understand that we have been declared righteous by God, that there is no condemnation to those, Romans 8, 1, to those who are in Christ Jesus. And there's no condemnation. So God's never going to look at you. This is very important to understand warfare and say, you're going to go to hell. And he's not going to look at, the, at you and say that because God's righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed. This is Romans chapter four, was imputed to your account. It was registered on the credit side of the ledger. It was reckoned to you as righteousness. So when I stand against the enemy, the way the enemy defeats a Christian is through sin. You see, if he can get me to sin and I don't understand that I have on the breastplate of righteousness and I don't understand that, then I think, okay, I sinned. Now I'm outside the family of God. And God is saying, no, that's not true. He tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, if I name it for what it is, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive my sin now listen carefully and to cleanse me, to wash me from all unrighteousness. So if you and I are going to have confidence in warfare, then you and I have to know that our sin has been taken care of, that God has covered our sin, past, present, and future through the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, okay, that takes care of my sin, but I still feel condemned and I still feel in trouble. We'll talk about it when I come back. I just liked watching, looking at the flow of what the author was saying and how everything um, fit and where it fit and, um, you know, asking the how and the what and the why questions. That was just, that just really, really helps put it all together and make, helps me understand it. And so I would go to my Bible and I'd read it and it'd be like, oh, thank you, Lord. You know, you showed me, you, you spoke to me and that sunk in and made it solid. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. You start seeing how this book relates to this book and this book relates to that book. And it allows you to not only see the picture of salvation, you know, the history of Israel, um, the future, whatever the future holds, but it also really allows you to know your God and his heart and his heart for you. You start having a personal relationship and a deeper relationship and a better understanding of why you believe what you believe. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. The book of Revelation tells us that Satan is an accuser of the brethren, that he accuses us day and night before the throne. 
And that's why it's so important that you and I have put on the breastplate of righteousness because his accusations are to fall to the ground. They are to have no quarter. They are to have no import. Now, how do we keep that so it's that way? Well, that means that not only have, do I have righteousness put to my account, credited to my account, but I am to live righteously. If you want victory in warfare, if you want to be able to stand firm, as he tells us three times in Ephesians chapter 6 in this subject of warfare, if you and I want to hold our position, we've got to know, listen, I have been positioned in righteousness because I have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, but I am to live righteously. And you see, when you and I do not live righteously, then we're in trouble and we are going to lose, not the war, but we're going to lose the battle. Let me show it to you because it's very important. It will help you understand a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is this young man who is uh, supposedly a believer has been having relations with his father's wife. Now whether that's his mother or, and, and this did go on, If you studied anything about the Roman Empire, you know that this happened, but it was a rarity. Now, this could have been his father's second wife, or this could have been his mother. At any rate, Paul is very upset with the church, and he's upset with the church because they have not dealt with this sin. They've covered it up. And that's what a lot of people do. They cover up sin. The minute you cover up sin, you're vulnerable in warfare. You're not going to be able to stand. Why? Because sin belongs in the enemy's camp and righteousness belongs in God's camp. Disobedience is in the enemy's camp. Obedience is in God's camp. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's talking about this young man, and he says in verse 5, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. Christ. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm going to withdraw my prayer support. I'm going to let this young man go. We're going to put him out of the assembly. I'm going to let him go, and I'm going to let him reap the harvest of that sin so that he will turn around and say, I have sinned, and he will come out from the snare of the devil. What I want you to see is sin gives the enemy power over you. And that's why, beloved, you must put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, remember, Satan is an accuser. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and this is a church that had a lot of problems, and so we deal with a lot of things. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says in in verse 3, but to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. Now, what had happened in Corinth is they were sitting in judgment on Paul, and they were condemning them, and they were lying against him, and they were accusing him, and this was warfare. I mean, it's warfare. And so this is what he says. He says, you know, I don't even examine, you're judging me, but I don't even examine myself. I don't even say, oh, I'm sterling in this behavior. He says, for I am conscious, and this is the key, of nothing against myself. Yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. He says, look, as far as I know, I've got on the breastplate of righteousness. As far as I know, there is nothing in my life that I have not brought to the plumb line of God's word and am living accordingly. I am living righteously. And yet that doesn't mean, you know, that I don't have a blind spot. But I know that God is going to examine me. So if you're going to stand in warfare, what's he saying? 
He's saying two things. Number one, remember, you have Christ's righteousness put to your account. You will never come under condemnation. So don't let the enemy threaten you in that way. Don't let the enemy say to you, oh, you're going to lose your salvation. Oh, you're going to go to hell. Oh, you're going to burn. And that because then you are so pulverized with fear, you can't do anything. The second thing is keep short accounts with God. Keep short accounts with others. When you sin, confess it. When you sin, confess it and forsake it. Do it immediately. Make it right with everyone. Then you've got on the breastplate of righteousness. So when the enemy comes against you to take you in, that breastplate will protect you from the enemy's attack. Now, the next thing he says, you have put on the belt of truth. You have put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now he's saying, and and my shoes do not look like uh, uh, the sandals that the Romans wore, but he says, now shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Those shoes that they wore into battle had like metal cleats in the bottom. And those metal cleats kept them from slipping and sliding and enabled them to stand firm. So what is he saying? He's saying, listen, in warfare, you have to know that you're at, you have to know and understand that you're at peace with all these men around you. All these men around you, do you remember when Caesar was killed? Have you ever seen or studied about Caesar's life? And when they're stabbing him and he looks at Brutus and he says, A2, Brute, you too are my enemy. So one of the things that you have to know in warfare is you have to know that you are at peace with God and that you are at peace with every fellow man in the body of Jesus Christ. The world's going to hate you as we saw, but you are to be at peace with everyone around you. And this gives you the ability to stand. Now, what does the enemy do? He wants to strike fear in your heart. If you ever listen to National Geographic and and, and the series that they did on Alexander the Great, they will tell you that this young general in his 20s knew how he knew his greatest weapon in warfare was fear. And so when these, his armies came out and they came out in these phalanxes and they had their shields about them and they had their spears and they had their scabbard in their, in, in their, uh, uh, um, armor and they and they were standing there in their breastplate and their helmet of uh, uh, that they had on their head to protect them what they would do is they would rattle those shields and hit them with the spears and they would make this blood curdling noise and and here was this it was like a tank that was coming at them and when that tank was coming at them with all this noise and clamor and yelling and screaming and these ungodly sounds coming out it struck fear in the enemy. Listen, Satan is going around like a roaring lion. He wants you to fear and you need to memorize 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us power. He's given us love. He has given us a sound mind, a mind under control, not one fearful, not one panicked, not one not knowing where to go. Oh, beloved, be not afraid because if you have on the belt of truth, if you have on the breastplate of righteousness, then you having shod your feet are in good standing with God. You're at peace with God and you can stand. If somebody asks a question about anything, all we have to do is sit down with our Bibles and start looking maybe for some keywords and we can only come to the conclusions that are right there. Our opinions outside of that aren't as important. Like if me and scripture disagree, I change because there's so many misconceptions that I can have that aren't in scripture. Um, And it has helped me to know how to not just look at a verse by itself, but to look at the context to help me understand the meaning or to ask the five W's and H's as I'm going along and um, 
just like who is who is the audience that this author is talking about? Who is the author? Like, like knowing those things and knowing the historical background can really give you a lot of insight into what's going on in that book. Um, it's, I think that's really important to know. And without having learned how to study, I, like I said, I would, I would be lost. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. Visit PreceptsForLife.com or call 1-800-763-1990. As we bring today's program to a close, beloved, there are three precepts for life that I want to give you, three scriptures for you to hang on to when you are afraid. And the first one, and I'm going to go back to it because I quoted it, but what I would love to have you do is I would love to have you go in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and it is verse 7. And this is what it says, and I'd like you to memorize this. This is your assignment. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, or it could be a spirit of fear but of power and love and discipline. So if he's not given me a spirit of fear, but I am fearing, what do I need to do? I need to understand that this is not what he's given me, but he's given me something that is going to counteract that. And what he has given me that is going to counteract that is he has given me power he has given me power. He wants me to understand that I have his resurrection power. As Ephesians says, I'm seated in heavenly places. And I need to remember that I have that power. The second thing that I need to remember is he loves me. He loves me. He laid down his life for me. The third thing I need to remember is this, that he has given me a sound mind, a mind under control. So what is the second precept for life? It's in Psalm 56, and it is in verse 3. When I am afraid, when I am afraid, the fear is not to be there. I'm to have, remember, I have power and love and a sound mind. But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. So when you are in fear, beloved, remember you've got the belt of truth on. And the truth is that God's word is truth and you put your trust in him. And what's the third precept for life? It's found in Galatians chapter 1. And in Galatians chapter 1, what he wants you and me to know is this, that God has said that we cannot be a bondservant of men. We've got to be a bondservant of Christ. The fear of man brings a snare. And so when you start to fear and you fear because you're looking at this person, you're fearing because of their threat, you need to remember, hey, the fear of man brings a snare. I'm not a bondservant of man. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So if you're doing what Christ has told you to do, if you are respecting and trusting Christ, that will take care of the fear of man. Go for it. Live it. Learn these precepts. They're precepts for life. Thank you for watching today. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more precepts for life.